Good evening and a very warm welcome on behalf of Milim uh, on this very warm evening. Welcome wherever you are in the UK and indeed wherever you are in the world. And for our regular viewers, you'll notice that my background has changed. I have had to decamp to a cooler room because it is way too hot in the room uh, we usually use for these presentations. Hopefully we'll be back to normal next week. Now, our series of online talks and conversations continues with our guest, Dr. Bernard Lester. I'll introduce Bernard in just a moment. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping first. Please do ask questions. This is possible by typing whatever you'd like to ask into the Q and A facility on your screen. And as ever, we'll try our best to get through as many of your questions uh, as we can. Can I also draw your attention to the chat facility? This allows you to uh, send a message to all of the other participants on this webinar, should you wish to do so. And finally, this event is being recorded. Uh, it will appear on the Millim website at millim.org.uk in the next couple of days. There you will find recordings of other past events, uh, as well as details of our future programme for which you can book tickets. And so to our guest this evening, Dr. Bernard Lester is uh, a dentist with more than 50 years experience. Last year, he published uh, a memoir, Open Wide, which recalls the triumphs and disasters, the dramas and close calls of his work in both the NHS and private practice. The book is an honest and sometimes humorous account. Uh, it's a, a, a really entertaining read. Uh, and Bernard is going to share some of those uh, details of his journey this evening. So, Bernard, welcome to Millim. It's great to have you. Thank you. Uh, so, what made you want to write this book? Um, I was coming up for retirement. I think it was 2020, uh, January, where I had a word with uh, the people I work with. And I said, look, uh, it's my time. Let's let younger dentists take over now. And that was January and we were due to go. We went to a lovely holiday in the middle of the Indian Ocean, uh, myself and my wife. And while I was there, I said, you know, there's so many things happened over those 50 years. I've got to write them down. And the writing became chapters and the chapters became a book. But um, then everything stopped with Covid. Um, and the time it was brought for, instead of June of 20, it was brought forward to March of 20. So during COVID, basically, I finished the book off. My wife um, is head of English at a school, and she did the proof reading, fortunately, because my English isn't 100%. Um, and that's the story. And uh, the more I think about it, the more things that happened, some to do with dentistry, some not to do with dentistry. Uh, I thought it would give people a real idea of what it's like, not just to become a dentist, but to train to become a dentist. And all the things that happen, it's not just about filling teeth, as the book shows, the marriage proposals, the things that go wrong. So I thought I'd base the book on Kipling, Triumphs and Disasters. Some triumphs, some disasters. And I finish off the book by saying more triumphs than disasters. I couldn't ask for more than that. Well, that sounds like a, a, a good plan. Uh, let's wind back to the beginning. So was there something particular that made you want to choose a career as a dentist? Um, 
it was a conversation I had with my friend. That again, I think it's in the first chapter of the book where we, we just didn't know what to do. It must have been about 13. And um, I, 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 I don't know how we got round to it, but I just said, you know, I've just been to the dentist and there's so many things there that are going on, so many instruments that I don't know about. It's all a big mystery. And at that stage, what you'd be talking about 1965, dentistry was not exactly in its infancy, but nothing like the sophistication as it was today. And I just thought this would be absolutely wonderful. And of course, to get in for dentistry and medicine at that stage, A-levels were fairly, shall I say, easy. Um, you needed three basic passes to get in for dentistry. Now, if you talk to some of the students now, they would laugh at that because they, they want major A stars plus a lot of other things. So although I passed comfortably, it was an easy profession to get into at that stage. And there was only 35 of us in the year, whereas now there's like 150 to 200. So it was a nice, cosy beginning for us. Um, the difficulty was going from sixth form to being a student. And I, I tried to show this in the book, the first lecture in anatomy, where we were presented with cadavers for dissection. This was not an easy thing. This was horrible. It's the only way I could describe it. Lots of fainting, lots of people retching, pickled bodies, bless some people who gave their bodies for dissection. Wonderful. But it didn't help us. It was a very difficult time that first year. So that's basically how it all started. It was not a whim. It was just something that seemed to be implanted. That's what I wanted to do. Not medicine, I could have done. Nothing else. It had to be dentistry. Now, to my mind, of the 35 people that was in my year at a dental hospital, I would say maybe 10 of us wanted to do dentistry. The other 25 were exceptionally unhappy during the course. That's how difficult the course was. You either wanted to do it or it was gonna be very difficult for you. So that's how I sort of slipped into it. Did you, did you have any memories of visiting the dentist uh, as a child yourself? Indeed. Um, the very first dentist I remember was the local clinic. Horrific, uh, bubbling like a witch's cauldron, I think I described it as in the book. Um, the apparatus to sterilise was a boiler. Well, it just doesn't work. Boiling does not sterilise. Uh, no gloves, no masks nothing like that and no anesthetic to speak of it was it was horrific and i can remember the lights now above the chair and what the dentist was saying to me at that stage so um i then went to a local dentist who was more modern and uh, when i told him what i wanted to do he said okay when you finish, let me know, you can walk into a job here. And that was the dentist that I went to as a child and indeed took over when I qualified. Let, let's just go back to your training. You mentioned mm -hmm. uh, working with these, these cadavers was, was not particularly pleasant. Um, uh, I suppose, what were the high points of your training and, and if there were any low points that you... That you um, high points? Um, the camaraderie, we made such good friends, right? It was, I can't explain it. it there were groups of six of us and we still have regular meetings, um, a reunion, and we still talk about the old days. Um, we had a common room where we all met up after a hard day. Um, it was just... I can't explain it. There was something about all of us training to become dentists. You know, it was the, the end of the trail that we were looking for, right? Four and a half years of graft. And we thought, would we ever do it? Um, so high points were 
passing the exams because they were difficult exams, sometimes two or three times a year. Low points, there were so many of them, but this was interspaced with and interlaced with humour. For instance, um, we had to design a denture, a metal denture, which was, to us, it was ridiculous. You know, we, it, we didn't know what we were doing, basically. So one of the, this was for a major exam, one of the um, technicians left the model of the exam, accidentally, he said, on the bench so we could all look at. So we all looked at this, made our notes, and we all came to the same conclusions about this design of the denture. And at the end of it, when the results came out and we all passed, the tutor in charge said it was amazing and a tribute to the teaching of this hospital that we all designed this denture the same way. Whereas in fact, it wasn't exactly cheating, but we got a little bit of help. These were high, high spots. Um, low spots, psychologically, it, this was a difficult thing. If you can imagine you're going from school to a university where you're suddenly dealing with people. Now, if you're making a set of dentures on somebody or filling a tooth on a model, as we called it, a phantom head, which was plastic teeth in a model, that's one thing. But when you've got an active moving patient, that is completely different. These were low spots because we just hadn't done it. My first injection, I, I mean, I can remember it now. It was horrendous. I, we knew what to do. But it's like what they say. You can watch one, do one, and then you can teach one. It doesn't always work out like that. But basically, that was the idea. Um, and then my first extraction which was maybe only, I would have been early 20s. So we'd been at university uh, maybe a couple of years and we were already taking teeth out. And of course I get the difficult one, a six foot three Irish Navi, no disrespect meant that at all, but he was a broad Irish accent, uh, a wonderful, wonderful man who did everything he could to help me. Um, but I couldn't get this thing out. Um, Eventually, someone came in and sort of gave me a, a helping hand and a hint. These were high and low spots. I put that down as a triumph just about in the book. Um, there were many other things. A lot of people had um, mental problems at university. And it was this which perhaps you don't see or you don't hear of at university so much now. Um, but people suffered because of the change, because of suddenly going from laissez-faire school, sixth form, no problems, suddenly into this more or less adult world of teeth, learning, anatomy, dissection, physiology, nervous system, bone structure, looking at skulls, looking at the underneath of the skull, which nerve goes where, I haven't a clue. We have to look at the books. Where do you get the books from? Libraries, books are very expensive. There was all sorts of low spots. But generally speaking, because we had this camaraderie, we worked together and we got through it. And the first year was anatomy. And that was probably the hardest year. If you got through that, you had a fair idea that without prejudice, you're probably gonna pass because that was the test. Uh, Two thirds of the people passed the anatomy exam. The rest took it again the following year. One or two dropped out. They're just gonna hack it. Um, and I can empathize with that completely. It was not easy. Dentistry is not just about going in to learn how to fill teeth. There's such a lot of spade work to do beforehand. A lot of theory, a lot of practical and practice to perform. A lot of stuff which would, you'd say was nonsense, but maybe once in a career, you need it, as has happened. Um, so the early years were formative. As we got on and became more senior in the dental school, things got a little easier until that final year. That was torrid. In what way? Well, you're dealing with two weeks of constant exams. 
uh, people think, oh, you know, you've done your course, you're fine, you get your degree, that's that. No, you have um, exams which include written papers, maybe eight written papers. You have vivas where people, the uh, professors put various specimens on trays and you've got to recognise these specimens the best you can. Um, I think I put one in the book. One was um, a piece of brain tissue and you have to recognise where the brain came from. And one of my colleagues said, it looks like a piece of curried chicken, right? Which really sort of took the edge off everybody and we all started to laugh and we got through it. And then you have to look at slides of various tissues on the microscope. Um, and then the dreaded vivas, where you had two or three of the most eminent professors firing questions at you. And they would just throw a skull at you and say, what goes in there? Or just put an X-ray on the screen, what's there? What are you looking for on this X-ray? Um, and bear in mind, uh, during, before you could take finals, you had to do a certain number of fillings, dentures, crowns, extractions, and you got points for them. And without this set number of points, you weren't allowed to take finals. So there was quite a few people that didn't have the recommended, recommended point system or totals. So there was all sorts of things going on. And I, I was sort of beginning to suffer sort of anxieties, um, not panic attacks, but anxieties like everybody else was. It was just a horrible time. But eventually the last morning came and it was a very early exam for me. And he said to me, as a dentist, what do you think about this? And I just couldn't answer because he just said, as a dentist. And I thought, Bernard, you've done it. You're qualified. Four and a half years of graft. Went out, burst into tears, like everybody else. Um, men, women, just huddled together. We just couldn't believe it. Um, and then you stop. You've qualified. We've had a more or less great time at university. Table football champions, canasta champions. You know, we did it all. It was wonderful. But then, suddenly, it all stops. You're in the real world. You've got to go and work for a living. I was getting married in three months' time after qualification. My God, I thought, house, a mortgage. So I went to the surgery where I went as a lad. I said, look, I'm qualified now. It's all right, you can start Monday. Well, you know, this I was going to travel for a bit and see a bit of the world. Um, but no, early January 1970, I started to work. And that's when it really hits home how little you know about dentistry. So, so how, how was that uh, transition? Um, you know, one day you're a student and for you, very soon afterwards, you're, you're working, you're in, you're in a practice. You've got real patients coming in uh, who expect you to solve their problems. Indeed. And I did some of them, not all. Um, there were several problems. First of all, I was used to seeing maybe one patient a morning. There were a dozen patients waiting for me when they got to the surgery. I just could not cope with that. And I was expected to treat them. I can only describe it as like being a newly qualified doctor in a hospital, because that's what it felt like. You didn't have any choice. You go on with the work best you can. First extraction, snap, broken, right? These are things I can remember clearly because I knew the theory. I didn't do any damage to anybody, but I knew the theory. That's all I can say. From there on, it was practice. Yes, I knew how to do a filling, but you know, when I did fillings at university, at the dental school, I was using a slow handpiece. Now, I don't know whether you've had a slow handpiece used on you, but it's nothing like the whine of an air otter at a quarter of a million to 400,000 revs a minute. This is like 30, 40,000 revs a minute. And there's a slow grind. That's what we used. And very occasionally, if we could get hold of an air rotor, 
we would use an air rotor for cavity preparation. So there I was with an air rotor in my hand, a, a lethal weapon, I must tell you. And I had these 12 patients to see in the morning. So I can only recall getting back home and being in a state of shock. Uh, it was quite incredible, the numbers of patients that needed treatment. I would say it took me maybe two years to come to terms with this. Um, and it was this change, this was the worst change. This was going from a student, all right, in a hard profession, to being an adult in a, a profession that was very demanding. You were getting paid for this, right? And there were pressures and the pressure started to mount. And by that time I'd got a mortgage and I managed to get through the first year. And then my boss said, look, I'm leaving. I'm going to my other practice in Oldham. And then I'm going to retire in Ireland. Do you want to buy the practice? Well, what does one do? I was, a year ago, I was a student. They say fair, happy, enjoying life. And now all of a sudden, married, which was lovely. Um, Financial pressures. I mean, for instance, you have the British Dental Association, you have your indemnities to pay, that is your insurance. Absolutely, you can't practice without it. And all sorts of other calls on you financially. So it was a disastrous time for me mentally. You know, I had to really fight to come to terms with the fact, look, you're an adult now, student days are behind you get on with it, which I did. Um, I bought the practice. Uh, half I could get from the bank and half I had to pay my owner, the, own, the original owner, over a two-year period. Such was the banking system at that time. And then suddenly it got even worse. I had to pay wages. I had to pay technicians. I had to pay materials and I had to work that into my gross earnings. And at the same time, run the house. My wife was working fortunately, which helped. So this idea that dentists are superbly paid with no issues, um, it, there is no factual, no facts involved in that whatsoever it is difficult um we have as a practice owner so many overheads and that's you know the building one of the floors collapsed above the surgery new units new dental units which i had to replace can cost nowadays anything up to 50 70 thousand pounds before you start so the financial pressures were getting to me in that time however Good news, you get over it, you get on with it. But I would say my saving grace was that I chose my staff very carefully. I got rid of the ones that didn't like me and didn't want to stay and got people who stayed with me 40 years, most of them probably more. And that's how I got through it. Now, one of the things dentists... Uh used to use when you started out is the general anaesthetic which i think was phased out uh, did you have some experience with general anaesthetics oh indeed um the thing is about general anaesthetics they were crude but effective now if you had children coming in with toothache seven eight nine year olds and sometimes younger you can't give them a local anaesthetic because they won't accept it. And mum and dad want you to do something. So we, each morning, and this was a real culture shock because I'd never given an anaesthetic. Each morning between nine and 11, we had a general anaesthetic session. This was gas, air, and a little bit of halothane, which really knocked them out. Now this was done by myself, or another dentist who was probably more experienced than me in giving anaesthetics, whilst the 
uh, other dentists did the extractions. Now, as I got on, um, I got a full anaesthetist in to do the anaesthetics because I didn't like the idea of a dentist giving anaesthetics as well as the extractions or two dentists. So I got a doctor in to give the anaesthetics. However, it was horrendous. The sessions were dirty, bloody, and uh, heartrending. They were effective, I won't deny that, but fortunately, the government phased them out and said no more anaesthetics in surgeries. This was a lifesaver because we just couldn't do it. It really was not dentistry. It was destructive and demoralizing and um, didn't do anything for your reputation as a professional. So yes, I did anesthetics, um, but I was very glad when they were phased out. Whenever I wanted someone, you can't actually do an anesthetic in dental surgery now. You have to get someone to do sedation. Now this brings up another issue. If you can't do anesthetics in the surgery, if a child, and it's usually a child, needs a general anesthetic, what do you do? Well, you have to send them to the local hospital with a waiting list. There is another problem because the waiting lists are waiting lists and can be horrendous. You can't tell mum and dad, look, it's gonna be six months on the waiting list. What are the options? Very difficult. You can go privately, possibly, or we can sedate some children if they're old enough, or we can use a local anaesthetic. So all in all, when the general anaesthetic was phased out, it was a wonderful moment. Um, are you the kind of dentist who takes his dental instruments on a holiday? Yes. Yes. And has that ever yeah. resulted in any any interesting yeah. interactions? Um, I was away once without my dental kit, and I bit on a cherry stone and bust a tooth, and that was it. So from now on, I thought, I'm bringing a full dental kit with me. So I can do most things, including an extraction if I need to. Um, I've had to re-cement a, re a bitch for my wife. I've had to put a temporary filling in myself. Um, I can do most things. But on one occasion, I remember we were in Crete on a lovely family holiday. I got a call from the surgery, which was unusual, to say that, look, Mrs. X, his daughter, has terrible sensitivity from her filling she's lost. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're on holiday, what can she do? So I said, well, can she not see a local dentist? So she said, well, she's in Crete. <clears throat> so I said, well, I'm in Crete. On asking exactly where she was, she was about a mile down the road. So we got in touch with her and she walked down to the hotel where I was staying. I got my kit out and we put a dressing in for the child, which was wonderful. And she always remembers that story. I would put that down as a triumph. But you've got to go a little bit further with, pay, with people. If you, want to, if you want to do your job, it doesn't really just involve people coming into surgery. Of course it does, but there are emergencies sometimes where you can help out. That child was, the holiday was being ruined and it was a simple procedure. It took me five minutes. Patient was very, very grateful sent a bottle of wine the following night. It was really nice. And I still see her, or I used to. So, yes, I always take a dental kit. And each year, the dental kits get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, you've provided treatment both on the NHS and also in private practice. What, what's the difference? I mean, presumably you don't have to wait so long for private practice, but is, is there, are, there, are there other differences? And I wondered what you felt about the, the current state of play where it seems patients really struggle to get uh, an NHS dentist. Yes, I, I, I've done both because I was fortunate enough just to fall into a private practice in the best part of Manchester, which was wonderful. So what's the difference? I made sure, Jonathan, that if a patient wanted to see me in national health or private, I could see them within 48 hours maximum. I di it didn't matter whether they were going national health or private. More often than not, I would see them same day. And that's why a lot of these patients became friends. And I still meet people when I'm out shopping. 
that I've treated. Now, the difference between national health and private, you could turn around and say, look, I've got to have something done. I need four crowns along the top. Well, in those days, in the early days, it was probably easier than now to get four crowns made on the national health. Nowadays, it's just about impossible. So major treatments are not generally available on the national health. Um, most treatments are, if you can find a dentist willing to do it, for instance, root treatments are available on the national health, but a lot of dentists aren't too keen to doing root treatments towards the back of the mouth because they're so difficult and you need microscopes. So the difference between national health and private is that you've got a more varied treatment option. You, you maybe got, oh, look, I can do this bridge. You've got a gap, let's say, in your mouth. I can do bridge, I can do implants, or I can do a denture. Whereas on the national health, I can do a denture. You see the difference? Mm. You're restricted. The national health, very unlikely to pay for a bridge. This is more cosmetic, they will say. Not always the case. Sometimes they lean over backwards and they say, in view of the patient's need, you, you must do it. The other thing, of course, is the fees that they're going to pay aren't substantial. So you have to be very careful in the materials that you're using. I'm not saying inferior materials, but you have to be very careful in what sort of materials you use. Whereas if you're charging for a bridge, say a three unit bridge, maybe nowadays, probably around a 2000 pound mark, you can say to the technician, look, I want this A, B, C. I want you to use this sort of porcelain. I want you to use the finest metal. Right, I'm sending the patient down to the surgery to have the trying done so you can check the bite, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can't do that in the national health. You haven't got the time. You haven't got the finances. We have now, a question from, uh, from Irene uh, Glauson. So I hope I've pronounced your name properly, Irene. It's very relevant to this. She says, can you say why having, de having a dental crown is so expensive? Um, yes, the, the crowns to be made nowadays can charge anything between 150 and 250 pounds just to be made by the technician. So on top of that, we had to put in our charges, our surgery charges. So we have a, um, an approximation for what our charges are. And so we may charge 500 pounds for a crown because we know that between 200 and 250 or maybe 300 pounds, it's gonna cost us to make. Right, and then we've got all the other sundries, the wages, et cetera, on top of it. On the national health, you'd be paying 250 pound maximum, or I think it's about 260 or something like that now, a band three. There are three bands, one, two, and three. Three is for crowns, dentures. So you, you're only paying um, a relatively small amount, but of that 250 pounds, you do get some extra on the national health but you're still going to have to restrict the amount that you spend on making it. So that's the difference between national health and private. Also, the single, an odd crown is not an issue on the national health. I used to do many of them. But when you're dealing in more complex, four, five, six crowns, which are very common, you just can't do it. And the patient, you have to explain to the patient, look, sometimes... We can maybe do a couple on the national health, but I can't do them. We're just physically not allowed to do them. So that's the issue. That's the reason why they're so expensive, because the laboratory costs involved, the metals involved, they're all rare materials, rare metals. Um, it takes a good technician maybe a week to make these crowns. So you've got also the materials used for taking impressions. Nowadays, we use scanners, so we just scan the patient's mouth and send that straight to the technician. All scanners cost £15,000 at least. So the cost of the equipment to do these crowns is getting more and more. So the cost of the crowns is going up. So I hope that answers your question. I think that was very, very clear. Um, now, you describe with, uh, with great humour one of your neighbours in this building you used for the private uh, dentistry, uh, who was a gynaecologist. 
Uh, and I just wondered whether you'd had any uh, any fun with that. Did any patients yes, uh, <laughs> think you he were was, a gynecologist? He was the most wonderful man, large as life, always telling us stories about when he was in the Navy and very fond of his boat, and he, which he used to have. And um, a wonderful man, wonderful man, very well known in Manchester um, and a patient. And I got a call from him uh, saying, look, I've got a patient here. It's, she's, she's in labour, but I don't think it's imminent. She's complaining terribly about her toothache. Can you come down and see it? So I said, well, of course I will. So I toddled off down, got into the labour ward where this was before my first was born. So I wasn't too au fait with it. And... I went in and I saw him and there she was, legs akimbo, ready to give birth. And her words were, Doc, please do something about this bloody toothache. It's worse than giving birth. <laughs> so I quickly, I quickly managed to mix a dressing on my own, put a dressing in, got out as quickly as I can, just as the doctor says, push, push, push now. And I did, I pushed off. <laughs> very good but that was uh, a genuine most humorous moment uh, you couldn't write the script for that but it happened now some of the work you you describe in the book has been truly transformative for the uh, for the patients uh, and i wondered what was the most notable or memorable course of treatment uh, you, you've given to somebody there were many, but I would say the most memorable was the kidnapping. Mm -hmm. um, this was a well-known lady, the wife of uh, a businessman in central Manchester. Kidnapped, headlines in the paper. Terrible incident, really battered. I'd fitted a bridge for her six months earlier along the front of the mouth, which was very successful. She was hit with a baseball bat in the mouth, which did terrible damage. She was bundled into the back of the boot of a car. Right. And when the car stopped, she bit through, and she says it was because of the bridge was so strong, she bit through the string that was holding her arms together, lifted the boot and got out of the boot and managed to call somebody. Um, just stopped a, a car. Police came. Eventually, they arrested the guy. She was taken to hospital. I got a, a call from her husband, uh, a knight of the realm, uh, saying, look, I'd like you to come down to the hospital and just have a look at the damage that's been done. And I did. And there was a lot of press there. I sort of wheedled my way through got to the room and I just didn't recognize her. She was so badly beaten. So I said, look, we found out she's gonna be out of hospital in two weeks. So I took two very rough impressions just to get an idea of where we stood. I cut a long story short, we got her into the surgery for about three months, two to three months sorted her out with new bridges, new crowns. She looked in the mirror and she said, that's lovely, thank you. And as I put in the book, we all felt a little bit lost because this was a triumph beyond triumph. Kipling would have been proud. So uh, we didn't know what to do. You know, we just thought that's it. You know, we've done this most wonderful job in this patient and I'm not blowing my own trumpet here. It was just, we, it could have gone either way. We could have mucked this up. And then I got a letter from the husband. And in it, um, can I just read you the, 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 the bit that he put in the letter? Would that be best? Yes, yes. I can find it. Just bear with me.
Right. The letter came about three weeks afterwards and it said, Dear Miss Lester, I'm very pleased indeed with the result which has been achieved. More importantly, however, my wife is delighted with the result and this has done more than any other single thing to restore her confidence and get, into the, get her into the frame of mind where she is now prepared to face the world again and take up life where we left off three months ago. This is something which is beyond price and we are both very grateful indeed for your inestimable help in this direction. Yours, etc. Fantastic. That was... I sat down and I thought with my staff, this is a one-off. Unlikely to get anything like it. But we did a very successful case. We restored somebody to actually probably better than she was originally. We did our job, but we made someone very happy. We restored this lady's confidence because it was blown completely. She was in a real state. We got another letter afterwards. I saw a phone call from her secretary to say that she was bounding away. Uh, she was absolutely delighted with the results and she was back to her normal self. Normal self after what she'd been through was a real success. <clears throat> so that was probably the most memorable time, the most memorable patient, but there were lots of others, but that one has to be the highlight. Now you're a, a black belt in karate. Um, I wondered what made you get into that and whether it resonated with any of your patients. Um, yeah, I, I was always keen on it and I did it as a student, but I was getting a little bit too much hand damage and arm damage because it wasn't taught well. So I took it up later on in life, maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And um, I, I had a proper trainer who did it well. And eventually I got my black belt, which was really hard. And now I'm fifth Dan, which is sort of quite senior. But um, there was one occasion, when you get a, a black belt, it's a degree. You get a, a proper certificate, it's very important. Put it on the wall in the surgery. And um, I had this young lady in and she kept looking at the picture and saying, that's a very nice outfit that, isn't it, that you've got on. I said, yes, you know, I had to wear that for my degree. She says, have you got a spare outfit that I could borrow? And I said, well, yes, do you want to, do you want to be trained up? She said, no, I need it for my act. I didn't ask too many questions. So, I, yes, I, I gave her uh, what we call a GI, a gi. And um, I gave her a, a, an old one I've got. And then about three weeks later, we got a brown paper envelope pushed through the door. So I gave it, I said about my manager, I just opened that, tell me what's, what's going on, anything important. And she looked at it and started to laugh. And she was showing it round, all the rest of the staff, the other doctors. I said, what is it? She said, there's some very interesting pictures of that patient you saw that loaned the GI to, the outfit to. She said, did you know she's was uh, an exotic dancer? I said, I had no idea. I knew she was some sort of artiste. She said, no, she's an exotic dancer. Actually, she's a stripper. And there, with my outfit on, various things being shown, beautiful pictures, several of them, I said, that's lovely. I didn't know she was that sort of artiste. She said, my manager said, yes, that's all very well and done, but what about your logo underneath that everyone can see? I just collapsed. <laughs> I had no idea. There it was, my name emblazoned on this picture. Oh, right? dear. Oh, dear. So that everyone who saw it, and there must have been many hundreds. What an advert. I thought, I'm not sure about that. I wasn't no. sure whether that was a, a triumph or disaster, by the way. 
they say there's no such thing as uh, bad publicity. So, so um, yeah, possibly, possibly, publicity. possibly. I'm not sure what, where that got us. Now, I also read in the book that you'd constructed a, an anti-snoring appliance. So I was quite interested how that falls into the, the remit of uh, a dentist. How, how did that work and, and was it successful? Yes, it was very successful. I did quite a few of them. Um, the, the premise of it is that when you're snoring, you're uh, and usually on your back and your lower jaw falls backwards and your tongue starts to constrict your breathing. Now, take this to an extreme and you've got sleep apnea, which is serious, but not to an extreme and you've got bad snoring. All right. And this appliance, you took impressions, you put it in the mouth and it, you slept with it and it pushed the lower jaw forward. So there was no restriction on the back of the mouth or the tongue. And blow me, I found it worked very well. One patient came in and she said, Look, she said, I'm very distressed, new, newly married. Uh, my husband won't sleep with me because the, the snoring. She said, it's going to ruin my marriage. We don't have any sort of intimacy, shall I say. Um, what can we do? So I, I explained the principles behind the snoring plant. Thera snores, they were called it those days. And we fitted it. And I gave her instructions. Not an expensive item, maybe a couple of hundred pounds then. And she said, um, thanks, I'll try it. I wasn't optimistic because of the, the personality involved. But three weeks later, she phoned up ecstatic. I won't go into details, but it saved her marriage. She said it saved her love life. She sleeps with her husband now, no problems at all. And he wants to come in and see me. So as I put in the book, now I've become a sex therapist. So dentistry is not just about teeth, is it? It's about life. It's about other people's problems. It's about families. It's about relationships. So I had a holistic approach. If the patient had a dental problem, I would deal with it. If it was like the snoring problem, I would deal with that to the best of my ability and knowledge. There were other problems that came in, not quite aligned to dentistry, but I was able to help out. This made it a rounded profession for me. Do you follow? Mm. This rounded everything off. And on the last chapter in my book, and again, if I may, I'll read it to you because I think it was relevant. I'm now sitting in my office, staring blankly at my appointment book on the computer screen. I see lists of patients with familiar names and I can picture the families, the grandparents, parents and children. I can hear them talking about their lives, their holidays, personal problems, as well as their dental issues. And you know what? I feel flattered and honored that I've been able to touch so many people's lives. That I have more triumphs than disasters is so important to me as I look at the thank you cards and letters of appreciation from grateful patients. Rudyard Kipling, eat your heart out. Then I look at my appointment book again and move it forward to my retirement day. And beyond that, it's gray and blanked off as if the world will end on that day and there is no future. Well, it doesn't. It's just another completed chapter in my life. Would I do it all again? Meet and work with such a myriad of personalities a microcosm of the world and make a difference. Of course I would. That summed me up. I wanted to make a difference. And I have. And that's why I wrote the book. So what advice would you give um, a young person today who uh, perhaps was seeking a career in dentistry? Oh, that's a difficult one, Jonathan, because the first and most important one, be sure you want to do dentistry. Don't do it because you don't want to do medicine. Do it. Go, and go to your own dentist. Have a look around. Ask him what's involved. Do maybe a work day with him. 
we had many, many uh, children coming in and watch us work all day. Right? And they loved it. And one or two of them did dentistry. Um, go and speak to your own dentist and ask him what's involved. And then look at what you need to do for dentistry. They're not just looking at people who can fill teeth anymore. They want a more rounded personality. Uh, I doubt if I'd have got in now, actually, I'd have struggled. Um, so look at that and then think about all the things that are involved in dentistry. It's a much better profession now, but it's much harder. There are so many things to think of. You know, there's worries about what happens if a patient sues you. Can I afford to do this? Can I afford to do that? Nowadays, whereas I was just pushed into general practice, you have to do a vocational training year. So you'd go from university to a qualified dentist and practice with them. So all your bad habits would be ground out of you. So that would be the way to do it. But above all, make sure you want to do it. Look at all the professions. Be determined. If that's what you want to do, look where you want to be and find a road to it. Now, this book, uh, I, I get the impression, has been well received. Are you are you yeah. planning to are you planning to write anything else? Yes, I, I have. I've actually it's up for publishing now, and I've just been told it's going to be published this year. And it's called, would you believe, Open Wider. Now, if you look on the cover of my book, it shows me looking into the mouth. Or it shows what I would be seeing quite. Mouth. Now, what I've done on Open Wider, I've done it from the other perspective. I've done it from the patient looking up at me. So you're looking from inside the patient's mouth out. So that's what I've done. I've written the book about patients' stories. So the seven stories. Um, and these seven stories are based on people who came in to see me and their stories and their issues. Holocaust survivor, a patient who's in a serious accident, um, and lots of others. And it goes along like that. And they're very interesting stories. And I end up with 50 of the most humorous questions I've ever been asked in dentistry. Sorry, 20 of the most humorous questions I've ever been asked in dentistry. Some rude, some not. Um, one patient said, um, if I buy some breast implants, will you fit them for me? What do you say to that? You're not trained for that in dentistry. What do you say to a patient who genuinely brings out two breast implants and say, look, I've got these, will you be able to fit them for me? No, I say. Things like, um, can I have a diamond put onto my front tooth on the national health? No. Um, there are so many others, uh, uh, too many to, to actually bring to mind at the moment, but there are, there's such humour in the questions I've been asked. Um, but the last one was a, a woman who phoned to say, look, she's no car, she's no bus, she doesn't like buses, she's not getting a taxi. Will I take my dental chair and bring it to her house? No, I said. Um, a woman from BBC Radio, well-known, phoned me up. I said, I've lost a crown. Can you re-cement it for me? I said, yes, of course. What time would you like to come in? No, you have to bring your chair and your equipment to the uh, where I'm having the radio programme done. No, I said. Um, there are so many funny incidents, um, but the breast implant was probably the best. Uh, so th that's how I've left the second book. Well, 20 we'll look, humorous we'll, questions. We'll look forward to that. Now, when uh, we started our conversation, you said that you had hoped to travel the world, but you were plunged in, into your career earlier than uh, you'd hoped. Have, have you now managed to do the traveling that you wanted to do uh, at the beginning. Yeah, 
you know, as you get older, Jonathan, you, 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 you find places that you like, right? And people ask me, why don't you go there? Why don't you go to try this place, that place? No, we find places that I love, myself and my wife. Um, we go to Crete often, and in January, we go to the Maldives. And it's just a lovely place to relax and the most beautiful islands that you will ever wish to see. It's not over expensive to get there and it's just lovely once you're there. And in the middle of our winter, the temperature 31 degrees every day, it's wonderful. So we've got to the stage now where we don't want to travel the world. We've been to lots of places with our children and that's fine. But now we want what we know and what we like and what we love. And um, each time I go, I write a book. So open wider. Um, one of the chapters is is about uh, the accidental sleuth, about me, the dentist, getting involved with finding the culprit of uh, an attack on one of my patients, which was you couldn't write the script for that. But the um, publishers then said, well, what about developing accidental sleuth into a novel of some kind, which I've done. So we're about two thirds of the way through that now and they quite like it so far. So the third book will be a novel called The Accidental Sleuth, which involves patients, people who have met, who became friends, older people who became friends and who, um, whose journey together developed their personalities even well into their 70s. So that's the third book. Hopefully that will be next year. Fascinating. So uh, it sounds like you may uh, end up being a, a serial guest of ours. We, we'd love you to come back uh, and Delighted. tell us all about it when it's ready. So Bernard, thank you so much for being our guest this evening. Pleasure. If you want to, if you want to buy this book, you'll find a link on our website and also on the follow-up email uh, that we'll send you tomorrow. Uh, buying the book this way helps to support Millim, but it won't cost you any more. And to say thank you, I'm going to send you some of my photographs. This is Mug and David Adom, the Israeli Ambulance Service in Action Saving Lives. So hopefully you'll enjoy that. Now, just before we leave you, a few words about our upcoming programme. Next week, uh, the 25th of July, we uh, welcome Richard Zimler for his third visit to Millim, and this is the UK launch of his excellent and latest novel, The Incandescent Threads. Then the following week, on, um, in, on the 5th of September, it's not the following week, on the, on the 5th of uh, September, we do have Jonathan Sandler presenting the English GI. We've got events uh, in between the two. The English GI is a graphic memoir. It tells his grandfather's story of war adventures in Europe and the United States. If you want to know what's coming in between those two dates, visit our website at millim.org.uk, sign up for our newsletter uh, to make sure you don't miss uh, anything. Um, and all our events are free as always, but you can make a donation to support the cost of putting these events on. The link is on our website. So it remains for me to thank our guest, Dr. Bernard Lester, once again. Thank you so much, Bernard. Ber it's been an absolute pleasure. An absolute uh, pleasure. Thank I'm looking you. forward to seeing you all again at a future event. Until then, stay safe. See you soon. Thank you.